Hello and welcome to Central London for our exclusive coverage of the Sun Military Awards 2017, otherwise known as the Millies. The young men and women today are outstanding. It's a very, very special award ceremony. Very inspired by other stories. I just like to give them their credit when it, where it's worth. The guys in the forces, they're the true heroes. They're the true ones that are risking their lives every single day. We do appreciate, we haven't forgotten, and please keep on doing what you're doing because we really need you guys. We're at the historic Banqueting House on Whitehall, the venue for tonight's award ceremony. Just a few hundred yards that way are some of the monuments to the heroes and conflicts of the past, including the Cenotaph. Tonight, though, is very much about the present. We're going to hear the inspirational stories of tonight's winners. We'll hear about their bravery, their dedication and their selflessness. Your awards host tonight is Lorraine Perry. We start with the award for Hero Overseas Individual. This celebrates an individual from across the services for an act of inspirational heroism outside of the UK. Nominated for this award are Leading Seaman Sally Hughes, Air Engineering Technician Stu Rogers and Sergeant Kirsty Lyon Taylor. And please welcome on stage to present this award, Ben Fogel and the delightful Andrea McLean. The Hero Overseas Individual winner is Leading Seaman Sally Hughes. Wow. So, let's take a look at why Sally was nominated. Hello. How are you doing? You alright? Good to see you. How's it going? Alright mate, good. Good to see you again. Yeah, and you. Seems a bit flatter now, which is good. In February this year, Leading Seaman Sally Hughes saved Nick Lynch's life, along with 13 others. Nick's yacht was 500 miles off the coast of Spain when it was hit by a ferocious storm. In the darkness of the evening, we got knocked over, pretty much rolled all the way over by a, a giant, if not freak wave. Um, and then we lost a mast, um, we lost a deck cover. The boat was in quite a bad state. We'd all kind of been through the mill inside the boat. Royal Navy destroyer HMS Dragon answered their distress call, but was still days away. One of the other guys on the boat said to me, there's a warship outside. And I was thinking, well, that's great, but how are we going to get on there? Sally Hughes was put in charge of the rescue and would drive the boat. Everyone knew it was over the limits and that the winds and the swell was like uh, more than we could even imagine, but just would have never been an option for me to kind of say that I wasn't going to do it. And then we see this rib set off, you know, it's, and it, it looked tiny. It looked like a model from where we were. As we were coming in, there was such a swell that at times their yacht seemed like three metres above our kind of sea level. So the rib would be three metres lower than the yacht. And then as the swell would do the turnaround, we would kind of come like two or three metres above the yacht. It was like a 10 to 15 second window where we could get in and get the personnel off. You cannot belittle the, the achievement and the courage that it takes to do that. But you've got somebody who leaves the safety of a massive warship, gets in a tiny rubber boat, and battles their way through you know, this pretty rough sort of sea to get to us. I don't think I see it for what it kind of, as serious as it was, because I see it as I was doing my job and I was helping out 14 people. We, we are forever in their debt, you know, honestly. There are 14, 14 people who, as far as they're concerned and as far as science is concerned, she saved our lives in reality. Do you know what? 
You're only wee. You're a wee tiny thing. It's ex absolutely astonishing. Congratulations. How are you Thank feeling? You very much. Uh, overwhelmed. So, yeah, my height gets a lot of people, to be honest. <laughs> when I stood out of the boat after the rescue, they were very shocked by uh, how tall and how little I am. So, uh, you're like Mighty Mouse. <laughs> Mighty Mouse. Yeah, yeah. You, are, you are amazing. That is incredible. And I know you get trained for this sort of situation. But does that just kick in then? Yeah, so the training really just kicked in. But to be honest, I, I owe all my thanks to kind of HMS Dragon and the crew of my sea boat that day because I definitely wouldn't be here without every single member on there and definitely the two other people that were in my boat that day. So. And you said you're only doing your job. Yeah, I just... I... What a job, Sally, what a job, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, really, really amazing. We're yeah. so proud of you, we really are. Um, I bet you'll have a little drink tonight. I hope. Just a little one for a little one. Thank you. <laughs> so good to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. What an amazing woman. Right, our second category tonight is Overcoming Adversity. Now, it's awarded to an individual from the Royal Navy, the Army, or the RAF who has overcome personal adversity in any area of their life. Nominated for this award are Officer Cadet Padma Das, World Marathon Challenge former senior aircraftsman Lou Wigman, and former Captain Ibi Ali, and Row to Recovery. So please welcome on stage to present this award, Mr Bear Grylls. huge privilege to award the Overcoming Adversity Award to the World Marathon Challenge. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's have a look at why they were nominated. This is astonishing. Forces veterans Luke Wigman and Ibi Ali have overcome serious injury to take on one of the toughest races in existence. They've both completed the World Marathon Challenge. That's seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. They were injured in Afghanistan and Iraq and both needed specialist treatment at Headley Court. Luke and Ibi took on the marathon challenge to raise money for its replacement and faced some of the planet's most extreme conditions along the way. Pain. <laughs> Here, here. <laughs> you have to focus on the moment you're in. You know, when I was running a marathon in Dubai and I was struggling, I wasn't thinking about the following day. I think I gained that from the military. You know, you used to be told what to do, where to be. They started in Antarctica's frozen wasteland, running more than 360 miles between them before completing Marathon 7 in Australia. It was tough but knowing how the money raised could help others kept them going. It's an amazing bespoke facility. If we could just help one person go through rehabilitation at the Defence and National Rehabilitation Centre in Stamford Hall, we're happy with that. There's an obvious need for a new centre. Having put so much into it and wanting to do such a good job in raising the profile for the charity, you know, it, you know, it kind of gave, gave you the motivation to dig deep when times were tough and just just to get to the end. The result of pushing their bodies to the limit is just under a million pounds raised for the new centre. The pair also hope they've inspired others to follow their example. We're in a very fortunate position. We were injured. We've managed to make the most of our lives post-service, post-injury. So if that's a message we can get out to anyone that's injured, whether through military service or in civilian life, then actually, you know, if I can run seven marathons in seven days, genuinely anyone can. The new Defence and National Rehabilitation Centre opens in October next year, and to Luke and Ibby, that is the real success. <laughs> Guys, huge congratulations. Luke, let's you. start with you. I yeah. mean, I know there must have been some, some darker moments when you were in the middle of the, of the marathon challenge, and this now, looking back, must feel quite surreal. Yeah, do you know what? I think we, we both had struggles at a different point. Uh, 
points. You know, I had a really bad struggle, kind of three or four days in. I think the important thing is to kind of look in the moment you're in. Don't think about tomorrow. Don't think about the final day. Just think, how do I get through today? And the simple answer is you put one foot in front of the other, and before you know it, you're on the finishing line. It's quite simple, really. Ibi, what was your motivation? I guess um, you know raising money for the causes that you were must have been a huge driving factor. Yeah, certainly. And, and as Luke's mentioned, I went through rehabilitation after I was injured in 2007 um, at Headley Court. 18 months later, I was back in Iraq doing the job I love, and that was with half my arm missing. And the system works. You know, we, we have an amazing rehabilitation system. So why can't we just put together a new rehabilitation centre for the next 75 years? And really, that's the focus. For the guys that aren't born yet that will go through that rehabilitation centre and they need the benefit of that. So that's, that's the real motivation, I think, is just to make sure that other guys have the same choice I do. Right, award three is for the hero at home. It's an individual and celebrates um, someone from across the services for an act of inspirational heroism right here in the UK. Nominated for this award are Petty Officer Toby Jones, Lieutenant Jared Bambridge, Private Lindsay Clark and Corporal Vicky Keats. And please welcome on stage to present this award, Jason Fox and Frankie Bridge. Okay, so uh, the winner is Lieutenant Jared Bambridge. Oh, congratulations. And let's have a look at why Lieutenant Bambridge deserved this award. Richard Livett and his brother-in-law were on London Bridge as the terrorists attacked. The terrorist jumped out of the van that crashed us there, uh, and within a split second, he was right in front of my face um, and kind of bumped into me and put his arm round and stabbed me with the 12-inch blade, as we know now. And everything all around here was just going crazy. They were separated, and Richard managed to stagger to nearby Borough Market. That's, yeah, I was laying, ended up, ended up laying roughly about there. But Richard's fortunes were about to change with the arrival of Army Lieutenant Jared Bambridge, who was out for the night with his girlfriend. When I first found Richard, uh, he was lying on the floor, face down, clearly in a lot of pain. Uh, he had a couple of people over the top of him, one of whom was an off-duty doctor. I knew that he was here because he came and immediately took control of the situation. I immediately applied pressure to his back, tried to stem the bleeding as, as best as I could. He knew it was a terrorist attack. He wasn't someone just being stabbed outside of a pub or whatever or, or a fight. He knew that had been a terrorist attack and you could tell there were still terrorists around. And then the shooting started. My reaction was that if I left Richard, he was going to bleed out. Um, and clearly that wasn't an option for me. I could hear Gerard saying, no, I'm a soldier. Uh, I'm trained and he actually stayed while the shooting was all going on. Uh, he was kind of laying on top of me, to be quite honest with you, while gunshots were being fired all around. Lieutenant Bambridge helped get Richard to an ambulance, then went back out. It's thought he gave first aid to at least 10 people that night, saving many of their lives. If we are unable to see those shining lights in the horrendous terror and the carnage of a night like that night in London, then it is just terror and it is just horror. And if we allow that to happen, then the terrorists win and, and we mustn't do that. Jared remains typically modest. I don't see it as brave. I see it as doing what any human being would do, given the circumstances. Richard and Keith have a very different view. The fact that he had the wherewithal to stay with me, talk me through it. I was lapsing in and out of consciousness and he was constantly reassuring me. Um, and it was, you know, it was a great thing. I really do believe that uh, if Gerard hadn't been here, then I don't think Richard would have made it. I really don't. That's in my art. I really don't think he would have done. Congratulations, first of all. You must be really proud. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm honoured. Um, what struck me about the video and the story um, of yours is that the point where you could have left or thought of another option, that wasn't an option. Talk us through your thinking behind that. No, leaving to me was never something that even struck my mind. Uh, I saw people who needed help, they were in pain, and as such, my training and personality just kicked in straight away, and my instinct was to go in and help out. Uh, never for me was it a question of running away and, and going in hiding and looking after a bit of self-preservation. Uh, always the, the priority to me was to see how I could help out and get those people back on their feet. <laughs> Enjoy the celebrations. Congratulations. Thank you very much.
I'll tell you what, if I was in any sort of trouble, that is the man that I would want at my back, that's for sure. Right. Every year, at the judge's discretion, we recognise exceptional service from an individual, a group or a unit with the judge's award. This year is no exception. So to tell us more, could you please welcome to the stage, we're delighted that she's here, the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Thank you very much, Lorraine, and it's an honour and a pleasure to be at the Millies once again. It's truly humbling to hear about the achievements of each and every nominee this evening. You are all regulars and reserves, remarkable and inspiring. And I saw at first hand just a couple of weeks ago in Iraq the enormous difference which our armed forces are making in the world today. And I also know that you would not be able to achieve what you do without the love and support of your families who often have to make huge sacrifices of their own. In many cases, that includes being separated from loved ones at Christmas. And so it gives me great pleasure to present the Judges' Special Recognition Award to the personnel of Operation Rumen. Irma would be the most powerful hurricane to hit the Caribbean in living memory. Oh, it's awful here. I've never seen the like of it, and I hope I'll never see that again. It's absolute devastation. RFA Mounts Bay was first on the scene. We were as close as we could possibly get whilst still safeguarding the ship and the 200 people that are on board. Boris Johnson described it uh, as a scene out of the First World War. All the vegetation was stripped, there was no green left. Seeing the devastation when we first got here was a big shock. I don't, I don't think you could ever really prepare yourself for the way it looked. The British military was stationed on several islands across the region. But as progress was being made, forecasters predicted a second Category 5 hurricane called Maria would hit. Off the coast of Puerto Rico, a family of four tried to escape the advancing hurricane, but their boat capsized. RFA Mounts Bay joined the search. Within half an hour of the, of the Wildcat being airborne, uh, then it had located uh, the wreck. There was a real feeling that actually, how likely is it these people would have survived? The ship was in a bad state. The winchman tried to raise any survivors. He'd been making noise and banging on the hull um, to try and actually let people know that we were there. Forced to refuel, they left the wreck. But on their return, they found a mother and two children had managed to escape. The boys were, they just did everything they were told to. Um, their mom was very emotional. Uh, she kind of broke down when she saw the aircraft. I think the training that I did kicked in and I just sort of did what I knew I had to do. Safe on board and with the worst over, the mission continued elsewhere. In the British Virgin Islands, 40 Commando Royal Marines were helping some of the most in need. So there's a lady we met yesterday and she's had to move out of the house because there's no roof on it, it's completely soaked inside. So we're trying to get everything back up, get a roof on it so she can move back in. People are desperate so it makes you feel quite good to help people. But it's been good to get out here and feel like we've actually been doing something positive for the people on the island. It's just what we do. That's what happens, you know, you get tasking for something like this, particularly when it's helping people who are in dire need. Everyone just gets on and does it. But we're here 365 days a year. Uh, we've always been here and we'll always be here. Collectively, guys, a huge congratulations. How do you feel about the award? I'm supremely proud, really, really proud of uh, being recognised, of the task force efforts being recognised. So it was a big task force, 2,300 people. Uh, only 10 of us are here today, but um, there's a huge number of people who are represented by, by us being here. So I'm really proud of what they achieved. How tough was it out there, the work that you were doing in those conditions? Um, well, the Caribbean is notoriously um, difficult weather-wise, so it was very humid, it was very hot. Um, we were working very long days, uh, and it was quite emotional as well to see, to see the level of destruction and, and also speaking to the people on the ground. Um, so, so it was quite tough, but once you know that you've got a job to do, then you just get on, you just get on and do it, and everyone did that. So the biggest question of the night, there are 10 of you here, you're representing a lot more people who get to keep the award. I mean, you know, feel free to fight for it. <laughs> we'll discuss that through the evening. <laughs> 
Right, our next award is for inspiring others from an impressive list of nominees. This award honours an individual from the Army, the Royal Navy or the RAF who through their shining example has inspired others to go further and to achieve more. Those who made the shortlist are Chief Petty Officer Andy Gibbs, Captain Umesh Poon and Spear 17. Please welcome on stage to present this award. She's a huge supporter of the armed forces and she's a lovely, lovely woman, Penny Lancaster. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to say my husband Rod and I are absolutely blessed to be in this room with so many men and women of the armed forces. You are really our true heroes. So so thank you. Um, well, I was very thrilled and excited to be asked to be a judge again, and what a tremendously difficult job that was, wasn't it? Really, really, hard. really difficult. But I have great pleasure in announcing uh, the Inspiring Others Award goes to Spear 17. And this is why. <laughs> to finally be there you know, stood on the ice, you know, with the guys and, and watching that plane sort of fly off, it was like, right, you know, this is it. This is what I've been striving for, for for two and a half years. It's a journey few have survived, a coast to coast crossing of Antarctica, 1,100 miles across the world's largest desert in freezing temperatures. Spear 17 were a team of army reservists, their plan to raise money for ABF, the soldiers' charity. But 10 months out from their challenge, they were given an extra and very personal motivation. Tragically, only last year, um, a good friend of mine, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Worsley, um, he was attempting a solo, uh, unsupported, complete crossing uh, of Antarctica, uh, and sadly lost his life um, during that attempt. So I consulted with the team and decided at that point that we'd like to change the aims of our expedition uh, and attempt the route uh, that Henry was doing. It led to the team adding another leg to their journey to finish what Henry could not. They reached the South Pole on Christmas Day, but still had 300 miles to go and one important job to do. That was to honour Henry Worsley. They climbed a peak overlooking the route he took and built this memorial. The team themselves faced dangers on the trip, not least the freezing temperatures that dropped as low as minus 53 Celsius. They had to be careful in the extreme conditions most of the time. It is a harsh you know, environment, you know, the harshest sort of place on the planet. Uh, you've got the sort of mental battle uh, of skiing for 10 hours a day, uh, every day, you know, for, uh, for three months. Uh, that, that's a real sort of challenge as well. Um, yeah, the environment, the risk of crevasses, um, we're always concerned about, you know, falling into crevasses. Obviously, we went to great lengths to protect ourselves, you know, from, from frostbite. Uh, and, we, and we did quite well. We didn't get any major sort of frostbite injuries to hands and feet, but faces are always at risk. Despite their best efforts, one of the team was forced to end his trip at the South Pole. But the rest made it, completing the epic journey in 66 days. They are the first British and the first military team to complete a full, unsupported traverse of Antarctica. In the process, they raised money for charity, awareness of the Army Reserve, and honoured one of Lou's closest friends. For those five guys, you know, to go out and attempt that journey and, and sort of for them to, to reach the far side of Antarctica and, and do a complete traverse, you know, I'm immensely proud of, uh, of all of them. That was astonishing. I mean, especially um, for somebody who, Henry was a remarkable man, wasn't he? And he would have been so proud, so, so proud. Absolutely, and I would actually like to dedicate this award tonight to Lieutenant Colonel Henry Worsley, um, you know, a very close friend of mine. That's brilliant. That's very, very apt. That's amazing. Obviously, you did this for charity. I know yeah. you also did it in memory of a friend. That's right, yeah. Winning the award, it's almost like you're, you're now, you've done it for everybody else too. How does that feel? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's amazing for, for these guys, you know, to, to get the recognition, uh, having done this journey. I mean, these are all sort of young lads in the Army Reserves. I've been kicking around in the regulars for a long time, but, you know, some of these guys had never put a set of skis on their feet before. And then to go out to Antarctica and then successfully ski 1,100 miles across the continent, you know, for, for me, this award is about these guys and the team, you know, that went and did this absolutely incredible. Like, and I just, I couldn't be any prouder, you know, what they achieved, yeah, incredible. And we now turn to our award for innovation. This is a category which recognizes a company that has designed, developed, and delivered a piece of life-saving or game-changing equipment that's transforming the work of our armed forces at home and abroad. Nominated for this award are Warrant Officer First Class Paul Moonen, Harris T7 Bomb Disposal Robot, and Sniper Technology. Please welcome on stage to present this award, Rebecca Adlington and Mark Foster. I think um, sports people get branded as heroes so much, but all me and Mark have ever done is swam up and down a pool all day. So uh, for us, the men and women in the services, you guys are risking your life every single day doing something that we can't even imagine. So you guys are the true heroes. So thank you so much. And the, the winner of the Innovation Award is Warrant Officer First Class, Paul Moonen. Woohoo! Let's have a look at why he won the award. A safe landing on HMS Queen Elizabeth needs more than just a skilled pilot. From the crew on the deck to air traffic control, it is always a team effort. Right now, it is the Merlin helicopters, but soon the F-35s will join them but neither can land or take off without a fire crew on standby. And that presented a problem as the giant deck is four acres in size. The main problem we had was we had a 30 second response time to any aircraft crash or incident on that flight deck. So we had to be able to apply foam to that incident within that 30 seconds. This is what they used to use, the SF-90, a portable foam fire extinguisher. And the, the only solution that we could have had, really, was three Hulk and great rugby players to be able to run up and down that flight deck and drag that SF-90. So the scale of the problem was huge, but Warrant Officer Paul Moonen was up to the challenge. This, his solution. The NMAT firefighting module. The vehicle was already in service. It's used to move aircraft around the deck. Paul Moonen's idea was to load it with foam and a pumping system that can deliver 500 litres per minute, although here in training, it's only filled with water. It gives other firefighters time to arrive, at which point the module is connected to massive foam tanks on board the aircraft carrier. Not only is it an ingenious solution that keeps everyone on board HMS Queen Elizabeth safer, it also came in three and a half million pounds under budget. What could be better? Under budget? Yeah, yeah, right. Seriously, that's incredible. You should be running the country. No, She's no. gone, it's fine. <laughs> She's away, it's okay. Um, and it looks really cool as well. It's like something from X-Men or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it probably does. It was just it was a simple idea. I mean, it, it wasn't just my idea. I mean, I came up with the, the thing, uh, not the thing, the, the idea of we've got this tractor, yeah. everyone knows how to drive it, we all know how to maintain it. Why can't we put something on top of it that we can use on the aircraft carrier to make sure that right. it wasn't really to make the people safe on, on the deck, it was the air crew and the passengers that were coming onto the ship. It's amazing, the ingenuity of you. Were you always like that as a kid? Were you always sort of making things and doing models and no, sort of... No, no, no. I mean, my wife would probably say I can't even put up a shelf, but, um, <laughs> but no, it was just, you know, that, that's been my, my trade throughout my life was um, as an aircraft handler. So it was quite simple, really, to move from there's the tractor to put some sort of firefighting device on top of it yeah. to make everyone safe. I bet it needed you to see that, to, to make it happen. Thank you. Absolutely amazing and so well deserved. Thank you so much, Paul. Brilliant, thank you. 
Next up, it's the award for Hero Overseas Unit. It celebrates a unit from the Army, Royal Navy, or RAF, of course, for an act of inspirational heroism overseas. So let's have a look at the nominations. They are HMS Monmouth, the 1st Battalion Royal Irish Regiment, and UK Reaper Squadron. Please welcome on stage, delighted he's here to present this award, it's Ross Kemp. Uh, good evening, lords, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, 10 years on, and these awards are, I think, more important than they've ever been. We don't have a conflict like we had when they first started in Afghanistan, but you, many of you will be aware that there will be men and women of our armed forces being deployed over Christmas, far from home, away from their families. And I'm sure you'll uh, join with me in wishing them a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. So, best, or should I say, hero overseas unit goes to UK Reaper Squadron. And this is why, have a look. <laughs> the Reaper can change the course of a battle. Its weapons can destroy terrorist targets. Its intelligence can save lives. They fly over Iraq and Syria, but are controlled thousands of miles away by RAF crews from Lincolnshire. But inside here, they are in theatre, where decisions have life and death consequences. And so some of their identities need to be protected. Your heart is pounding, your hands are wet through, your neck is throbbing, and you still have to get that laser spot onto that target, because if you don't, friendly forces will die. They work in a team of three, a pilot, a sensor operator, and an intelligence coordinator. All are involved in identifying the enemy. We are looking for those key indicators of how they would operate, how they move, and, uh, and where indeed they are in relation to friendly forces, their orientation, so we are absolutely sure that they are uh, the enemy and they are posing a threat to forces. And they are good at it. We know what they're doing. We can see how they are tweaking their tactics. Therefore, we can tweak our tactics um, to always ensure that we remain one step ahead of them. Sometimes they have just a few minutes to act. This vehicle outside Mosul posed exactly that challenge. Through of our intelligence uh, individuals and analysis, we quite quickly ascertained that it was a, a suicide truck. Uh, we, uh, we saw that they were heading directly towards friendly forces. It was quite nerve-wracking. We, uh, we only had 60 seconds then uh, prior to weapon release, uh, and uh, we managed to negate the threat and, uh, and destroy the target. A large team comes together every day to make that happen, from the engineers, the communication specialists, the intelligence folk, and the aircrew that work together to get the airplane into the air, get it over where it needs to be, and then do the analysis on the intelligence that it collects. I think sometimes that they forget um, how amazing that effort is. Fantastic. Please welcome to collect the award, I Star Force Commander, Air Commodore Dean Andrew. What we've just seen looks like something from the movies, but this is real, this is real lives, real lives are being saved all, all the time, and, and that teamwork is, is really quite remarkable. Yeah, um, the Reaper Force, two squadrons operating from Lincoln, uh, one of them and, uh, from Las Vegas and the other, uh, to give us an eight hour time difference so that we can cover 24 hours. Uh, very, very special people that don't think they're very special, I'm incredibly proud of what they do. I think uh, a Royal Air Force-led led joint squadron, uh, there are Royal, uh, Royal Navy, uh, Royal Marines, uh, and, uh, and Br British Army there as well. Um, it, it is absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, the best of British. It brings everything that we've already seen, bravery, um, innovation, um, and pure determination to do what is right and put the UK where it needs to be. Thank you, that was so beautifully said. Thank you so, so much.
Right, back to our nominated awards. Our next category is Best Reservist. It celebrates an individual from any branch of the reserves for an act of bravery or exceptional service at home or abroad. Nominated for this award are Lieutenant Commander Ian Beaton, Corporal Philip Keel. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can cheer, please cheer, everybody, absolutely. And Squadron Leader Sue Shillady. Please welcome on stage to present this award, Helen Flanagan from Coronation Street and Matt Terry from X Factor. It really is an honor to present this award. And the winner of Best Reservist is Corporal Philip Keogh. Hey! Let's have a look at why. Philip Keogh was one of the first on the scene of the Manchester bombing. The explosion at the Ariana Grande concert was the worst terrorist attack in Britain since 7-7, killing 22 people. Corporal Keogh's been a paramedic for almost a decade. It's a career that's run parallel to his life as a medic in the Army Reserve. He was doing his day job when the call came in, and he didn't hesitate. I volunteered straight away to go to the scene. Some of my experience in the military and some of the injuries that I've experienced and, and treated in the military may help me. Uh, and some of my additional clinical skills and, and management skills may, may be of use. Philip Keogh was deployed to Afghanistan in 2010 as a reservist, treating battlefield injuries in Camp Bastion. That experience helped in Manchester. We didn't know what, what type of injuries we were looking at, but I had a fair idea from what I'd done in Afghanistan uh, and, and the consideration that, you know, if, if it was a bomb. And you start doubting whether you are the right person, but then I think you have a word with yourself, you take a breath, and, and uh, the, the training definitely kicked in. Philip joined forces with other senior paramedics. Together, they treated the injured and organised the evacuation of casualties to hospital never knowing if there'd be another explosion. Dan Smith, uh, my consultant paramedic, he was there on scene. Uh, I went straight to Dan and he directed me to uh, commence triaging. Victoria train station, I, I used to commute in and out of, never looked so different uh, with, uh, with people just sat on the floor and, and I don't want to talk about it. Colonel Nick Medway served with Philip in Afghanistan and is proud of how he responded in Manchester. That's the sort of thing that we're training our reservists to, to be able to do, to go that extra mile. Churchill used the phrase twice a citizen and I think that's really a very good um, description of somebody who's in the reserve. The Millies has put the spotlight on Philip Keogh, but it's attention he wants to share with everyone who stepped up to help performed as a team that night and as a team we were able uh, to do, I hope, a good job and I think the recognition should be towards everybody in the team regardless of what uniform we had on that night. Philip, first of all, huge congratulations. How, how proud do you feel? Uh, yeah, uh, immensely proud uh, to, to, to recognise this and receive this on behalf of all the, the work that all my colleagues did on that night. When you sort of decided to volunteer your services to go and help on that night, how important was your military training? I'd obviously served in Afghanistan and I think that played a huge part in, in allowing me to consider some of the injuries that I may be faced with and some of the situational awareness that one would have to consider uh, going there. The immediate days after that, that tragic incident in Manchester, the whole community in Manchester came together like I've never seen before. So taxi drivers were taking people home for free. Takeaways were opening the doors and feeding people for free. The homeless were, were being looked after and they were looking after people and strangers were looking after people. And, and for me, the, the recognition that this is bringing to, to Manchester as a city and the work that everybody did, regardless of whether they were in uniform or whether they weren't. Some of the true heroes that night weren't wearing uniform. You know, and, but some of the other heroes, and, and my colleagues especially, they were, and, and they chose to go into that site. You know. Uh, and they put themselves on the line to serve a community that we, that we choose to serve. And, and it's really important for me to, to, to make sure that people are aware that this, this is for them, you know. And, and I know that obviously it's for best reservists, but for me, if it wasn't for the team that I was part of, 
this wouldn't be here, and, and, it, and it's really recognition for that. Right, so our penultimate award is for the Hero at Home unit. It recognises a unit from the Army, Royal Navy, or RAF, of course, for a single act or a continued effort in the UK in the highest tradition of the armed forces. Nominated for this award are Southern Diving Unit 2, yep, HMS St Albans, and military co-responders with the South Central Ambulance Service. Please welcome on stage to present this award, Anita Rani and Jamie George. It's such an honour for me to be here in such esteemed company and uh, everyone involved in the forces is such an inspiration uh, to everyone involved in the rugby community. So I honestly can't thank you enough for everything that you do. So. Absolutely. It's incredibly humbling hearing the stories about dedication to service and your courage. And as you said, it's a real honour to be asked to present this award. So the winner is Southern Diving Unit 2. Let's have a look. Each of these bombs had the power to kill people here in the UK. They were made safe in controlled explosions by Royal Navy divers. Over the past 12 months, they've repeatedly put themselves in harm's way to clear nearly five tonnes of explosives from the seabed. Bombs, mines and even a torpedo were all recovered by dredges clearing a path for the new aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. From one large German ground mine that was discovered in the entrance of the harbour, which was the first major job back in November 15, and then it carried on right through, right up till the last job we disposed of was a German airdrop bomb, which was in the gripper arm of the dredger, just off Portsmouth Harbour train station. Diver in the water. Even though the carrier channel is now open, the work for Southern Diving Unit 2 continues. Sonar has detected something else on the bottom. Deciding if it's another World War II bomb requires a delicate touch. Well, there's no visibility to going down, so it's just trying to go slowly, work your way around, make it a thorough search, so we can identify anything that could be there. And if there is something, obviously we're not going too aggressive into it. Diver on a surface, 13, 35. You can confirm it's non-ordnance. Yeah, no, no. Okay, happy. A few weeks earlier, it was this. A German mine dropped during the war. The mine itself was actually in the claw of the dredger, so we had to attach the lifting bag on the deck of the ship, which is actually a new technique, but we had to adapt there. Um, and then once it was in the water, we were able to tow it out to the ground over by the Isle of Wight and then finally to ensure that it was all, all good to go, basically, and then light the safety fuse. This, the result. The nature of the work means few people see what these Royal Navy divers do to keep the country safe. There is no doubt that without their dedication, HMS Queen Elizabeth would not have been able to sail home to Portsmouth. But whether at sea or on land, whether it's bombs from the war or the modern threat of IEDs, Southern Diving Unit 2 remains on call 24 hours a day, every day. We talk a lot about people walking away from danger. You guys are literally swimming towards it. You must be all slightly bonkers. Well, um, the training, <laughs> everyone seems to have talked about it tonight, but it actually really does go back to the training. We train robust men and women in the diving branch. We train them hard to have strategic thinkers in situations, stressful situations, so they do actually remain calm and alert when they're down there diving towards what you would call danger. And how nice is it to be, to be recognised for the work that you guys do? Yeah, it's nice. I mean, it doesn't happen very often. Usually we just kind of go under the radar, you know, so... Hey. But The job in itself is reward enough, um, yeah. but to be recognised, to be singled out from a, a cast of... of uh, of massive high achievers is a, is a unique honour uh, and it means a lot to us. It, it, it's a truly humbling moment. It really is. Fantastic. Now, 
as you know, behind the Armed Forces community, there's a wide range of support networks. And we're going to wrap up the awards tonight, because you must be starving, apart from anything else. But we are going to wrap up the awards tonight, recognising three groups who provide this much-needed assistance. The support for our Armed Forces Award is given to a civilian charity, a group or a company that has delivered unrivaled support. Our nominees tonight are Phoenix Fund, Veterans with Dogs, and the John Egging Trust. So please welcome on stage to present this award, Mark and Peter Cavendish. And the winner of this award is Veterans of Dogs. Ah. And here's why. Let's have a look. Did you find it? Did you find it? Richard Mearns and his dog Ziggy are inseparable. Richard was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder in 2009. By then, the life most take for granted had already disappeared. He got Ziggy a little over a year ago, and things started to change. It's been fantastic. It's saved my life. He's brought me places so I, I would never have been, and he's kept me from places that I never want to go. Richard says Ziggy can predict when he's going to struggle, sensing changes in his body chemistry. The benefits are wide-ranging from preventing or shortening Richard's flashbacks to helping him get to work. The crowded commute can trigger anxiety. He will actively use his head to nudge me place on me. He will interact in that way. Ziggy was provided by the charity Veterans with Dogs. Each animal can be trained to help a specific person's needs. All of our dogs will wake a veteran from a night terror, for example, but it's whether or not the veteran then wants to go immediately back to sleep or they want the dog to turn the light on. Um, different medication needs require different reminders. Our dogs are very good at reminding their veterans to take their meds. The trainers at Veterans with Dogs are all volunteers and the charity relies solely on donations. Though small, at the moment, their work continues to have a massive impact. Well, to say they're lifesavers is, is, is what they are. They've brought me back down to who I used to be. There's still a long way to go, but we're getting there. Without Craig, Andrea, Kirsten, and everyone else at the charity, I wouldn't be stood in front of you today um, because I wouldn't be here. They have changed my life. Ziggy has changed my life. And without everyone here, um, well, this hound wouldn't be standing in front of you. He is fantastic. And as you can see, he is probably the most chilled out Labrador you could ever imagine. It's life-changing, absolutely life-changing, it really is. You're a small charity doing big things, changing right. lives, saving lives as well, but it's all, it must be hard because obviously you need to raise funds all the time and it's tough. That is hard, isn't it? It's extremely tough. Yeah. We're competing against everybody for the same pound that people donate. Um, but the money that we do get, we put to good use. You do. We stretch it as far as we can and it's working. That's the important thing, is that the funding that we're getting is enabling us to do more of this. <laughs> and it is, as we said, it's absolutely life-changing and, and really, really helps people. It must be so good for you to see that. <laughs> Where are you going? What are you doing? He's off. Honestly, everyone's a critic. He's away. It's fine. There he's back. Hello. Hello, yeah. baby. He's just, do you know what? He's probably making sure that everything's all safe. Yeah, exactly. he's, doing, he's, doing, absolutely. he's doing a check. Yes, he is. He's, he's looking around to make sure we're safe. We are so privileged and humble to be in a room with so many heroes. And you do your job so splendidly, but there is sometimes a price that's paid. So we, in recognition of giving back, to say thank you for all the things that you do for us. This is what we do to pay back. And it is help amazing. We'll move on. You do. You really do help people, and it, and it, does, it does save lives. Thank you for everything that you do. I hope this award helps in some way. And thank you very much. And thank you, Siggy.
Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for the millions from Banqueting House. You can watch all the stories of tonight's winners on our website at forces.net. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.